All right. I'm here to talk about Fight Club. No, today, today, you might be wondering why I'm wearing these. Let me just open my Bible up here. Actually, I can't, I can't do anything with these things on. We are talking today about the book of Jude. Now, if you've ever read the book of Jude or even heard a little bit about it, you know he really is. I mean, he hits hard. And this whole series of one-hit wonders, if, if this is your first time here, I know I kind of introed that a little bit up front, but these one-chapter books of the Bible, man, they pack a punch. They get right to the point. There's no messing around, no mincing words. The authors are like, listen, this is the issue, and we need to get after it. We need to dig in and talk about it. So that's what we're doing today. With the book of Jude, we're talking about fighting for something that matters. I'm going to start right off here in verse 3 because Jude opens the first couple of verses, you know, greeting them, and then he gets right into it. In verse 3, he says this, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation that we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's people. Do you hear the urgency in Jude's writing? Do you hear him? His heart is being poured out in this letter right from the get-go. He's like, I wanted to talk to you guys and just celebrate the salvation that we share in Jesus Christ. But I felt compelled. There was something urging him, almost pushing him to talk about this. And what is this? He's urging us to contend for the faith. Now, I say this as he's saying to us because, yeah, he was writing this letter to the churches in the regions around him and, and those beyond, but it was meant for so much more, for the church, and that includes us today. And there's things that we're going to talk about in this today that some things might be a little bit like, wait, what is he talking about there? And, and there's some history there with Jude and what he's talking about but this message that he's writing to the church is for us today. In fact, it might be more for us today than when he was writing it. To contend for, to fight for our faith. Now the question is, faith in what? What kind of faith are we talking about here? And, and contention and fighting, I mean, that's, that's a contentious thing. Right? We're, we're all the time realizing that in this world today, there's disagreements and arguments and, and contention, and we're just like, man, we don't want a part of that. Well, right, we don't want a part of how the world fights and what it's fighting for. That's not what Jude's talking about. He's talking about contending for the truth, for the faith, the gift that God has given to each and every one of his children. Because it's under attack. We have an enemy, and it's not people. We have an enemy that the Bible calls him the devil, Satan. That word, those words mean adversary or enemy. But we have another enemy that we don't talk about enough, that Jude gets into, that Paul discusses, and this enemy hits close to home, and it's us. It's our own earthly human nature the part of us that it's the reason we needed saving in the first place. It's the reason Jesus came to this earth was to save us from ourselves. And it's that part that we need to contend with, that we need to contend for the faith against ourselves. So gloves are coming off because the enemy doesn't fight fair. And if we're honest with ourselves, we don't fight fair with ourselves. It's always attacking, so we're going to get into that. But faith, this, this word faith, I want us to just kind of dig a little bit into this real quick before we move on. Because I think it's one of those words that it does seem a little bit like faith, you know, like it's, it's intangible. I don't know how to get a hold of it, so I don't really know what to do with it sometimes. I don't know how to even fight for it because I'm not sure what it is. Belief, right? It's believing. Yeah, that's a big part of it. But faith is even more than that. 
Because remember, this is a gift from God to us. Jesus said that even a mustard seed amount of faith, very little faith can move mountains. Something that seems impossible was his point. Even just a little bit of faith can do the impossible. Faith can move mountains. Faith can break down barriers. Faith can deliver people from darkness. People can give, or faith can give people hope when it really doesn't seem like there's hope or there shouldn't be. Again, faith leads us through the impossible. It's something God has given to us for many reasons, and it's something worth fighting for. And I think that's why the enemy tries to attack it so much. I think that's why we struggle so much with faith sometimes. That it seems difficult to believe because as we're going to see here in a little bit, we can be our own worst enemy. Jude goes on to say in the very next verse, he says, I say this, what we just read in verse 3, I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago, for they have denied our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now, how many of you, when I read that, locked into some ungodly people have wormed their way in. I know the first time, second time, several times that I read Jude, that's where my mind went. And then the Lord revealed to me through his word that I was missing the point. Jude is not talking about the people. Yeah, he's, he's using them as an example, and we're going to get into that in a little bit, but the point isn't the people because, again, people aren't the enemy. If we're going to fight for this faith, we need to know who we're fighting against and why we're fighting. People aren't the enemy. We have an enemy and we need to identify that enemy so that we can rightly contend for the faith. The key there is not the people, it's what they're saying. Saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. Whew, man, what a statement. God's grace. Okay, we talked a little bit about faith that he's given us. Grace is another gift that he's given to us. This favor that he has poured out lavishly on us when we did not deserve any of it. God's grace is truly marvelous, the way Jude puts it. And this grace, these people here were saying that, well, God's grace, we can... We can live immoral lives. We can do these things because we're under grace. Well, Paul actually says it really well in Romans 6.15. He says this. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? By no means. In other words, no. No. That's not what God's grace is for. That's not what it does. In fact, the word grace, charis in the Greek, actually it, it does mean favor that's, that's unmerited. In other words, we, we didn't deserve it. God still poured his grace out. But it also means this. It's a divine influence upon the heart. God's work on our heart. That's the grace of God, that he would work in our lives and actually help us, cause us to walk in his ways to seek after him. God's grace is so much more than just the favor that he's given to us. It's the strength, the power, the authority, the courage for us to live for him. God's grace is amazing. It is marvelous. And to say that, well, we're under grace, we're saved, we can kind of do what we want, is cheapening God's grace. I want to read you this quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. This guy was a pastor in Germany uh, during Nazi rule. He said this, cheap grace is grace without discipleship. It's grace without the cross. 
It's grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. That kind of grace is not the grace of God. That kind of grace is what, frankly, I mean, I tried to work into my own life many times because I wanted to make an excuse for the way I was living. That kind of grace is certainly cheap. Now Bonhoeffer, this guy, uh, pastor again in Germany, Nazi rule, was a very vocal opponent against Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party. He was speaking against uh, Hitler's persecution of the Jews, so much so that they finally uh, captured him, imprisoned him, tortured him, and he eventually lost his life. But we know that he went home. But the legacy that he left, speaking of what real grace means, he wasn't just speaking against the Nazi party, he was speaking against the worldliness that he saw in the church. And frankly, today we're battling the same thing. In the church today, it, there's so many ideas and so many things that we bring in, but does it really line up with the word of God or not? That's the question we need to ask. This is what Jude is talking about here. And, and so when we look at this, this concept of grace, I want to read you this from Hebrews 4, 12 through 13. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God. Everything, everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we're accountable. God sees it all. God knows it all. He already knows every struggle that you have, every fear, every doubt, every worry, every celebration, every joy, everything. And I've heard people ask, well, so why do we even really need to like pray? Because God already knows. He does. That's not why we pray. We pray because it's it's that relationship that he wants for us to get stronger and stronger in with him. We pray because it takes us laying aside our pride, humbling ourselves, and coming before the Lord and saying, I just want to spend time with you, or I really need wisdom or help, or I just want to praise you for who you are. When we pray, it strengthens that bond between you and the Lord. And Jude is, is coming back to this idea that we just read about in Hebrews 4. That the word of God is powerful. Now there's a lot of things that show us that the word of God is remarkable, for sure. Just in archaeological discoveries and the, the amount of manuscripts we have and, and the, the testament of so many people. But what we just read in Hebrews 4 describes why it's powerful. Because it changes us. The word of God, when we read it, it, it reveals to us who we are. The Bible reveals to us who we are and that we need to let God work and move in our lives. The word of God reveals who we are outside of God and in God, with him. Who we are outside of God Well, the scripture says that when he formed mankind, he formed us out of the dust of the earth. In the Psalms, David says, Lord, you know that I'm just dust. And yet he loves us more than we can imagine. The world tells us that, yeah, you are just dust. You're just a speck in the universe, floating through. All of a sudden there was nothing, and then boom, life happened, and you're just a blink of an eye, and and." Your life is just this, it's over, and then it's done, and there's nothing. That's what the world says. That's not what God says about you. God says, yeah, I formed you out of nothing, but I made you something. Before time began, he had you in mind. He knew he was going to form and fashion you and create you and bring you into this world in the hopes that you would choose to be with him for eternity. And if you do, and if you do cry out to Jesus to save you, and I know many of you have, then you realize that it's not only that you get to spend eternity 
with the one who is love, but even right here and now, you get to experience hope and joy and peace and love and goodness in ways that we didn't have before we came to God. This is how much God loves us, that he would make a way for us out of that darkness, that he would give us real hope, that he would show us that we're worth everything. Everything. You are worth everything because the same God who made us then came to be with us and died for us. Every human that he formed, he came and died for just to give every person that chance, that hope to come to know him. This is what the Bible shows us. This is what it reveals to us. It reveals our need for him. It reveals how lost we are without him. And that no matter how much we struggle and how much we try and how many things we fill our lives up with, that void, that gap that can only be filled by him will never be filled by anything or anyone else. So Jude is is reminding us that the Bible here the Bible is that blueprint. We, we put it on our walls and we say it here because we believe it. That the word of God, the Bible, is the blueprint for our lives. It's our GPS or maps. How many of you remember like paper maps, right? Driving around, there's a woo-woo, I hear it. I mean, they talk about phones being dangerous today. You try driving and finding like a direction and you're like, where am I at? Somebody asked, like, what did you do before Google Maps? And I was like, we used maps. No, no, before Google Maps. Like, paper maps. Rand McNally, yeah. So, but, but these maps, these GPS maps, whatever you were using, these were, these were made up by people who had been there already. They say, I know the way, and so we're going to create this map. The Bible Jesus has been there. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's been there. He knows the way. So the Bible is our directional guidance system. But the thing about this one is, it's never going to lead you astray. I mean, come on, let's be honest. Some of these GPS, they still don't always work. (laughs) I was trying to get to Ohio, and how did I end up in Illinois? The Bible will never lead us astray because it is the Word of God. It is living and powerful. It's able to divide even between our soul and spirit. I don't know how that happens, but the Bible can do that. It can reveal who we are before God. And so in verse 8, Jude goes on and he says, in the same way, because he's still talking about these people, again, as an example of what they're doing and saying, These people who claim authority from their dreams live immoral lives and they defy authority and they scoff at supernatural beings. Now these are not the kind of dreams that you get from eating too many tacos at dinner. The dreams that Jude is talking about here, these people were saying that they were divinely inspired dreams. Well, okay, that's something he was addressing there. What does that have to do with us today? Have you ever heard it said or maybe you've said it yourself. I know I've done this before. Well, God told me. I heard God tell me. And my question would be, how do you know that? There's a way to know. And it's this right here. God told me. Okay, well, let's see if that's... I'm not seeing it, so I would... I would really seek him on that. Or, actually, no, it says the complete opposite. And I'm going to give you a very simple formula here. Now, I do not like math because I'm not very good at it. I, I, God bless those people who love math. <laughs> I, I, I admire you greatly. I am terrible at it. But I'm going to give you a very simple formula today. No X's, Y's, or Z's. This is very easy. 
If it opposes God's word, it's not from God. If it doesn't line up with his word, it's not from God. Now, if you don't see it in God's word, I would encourage you just to have patience and ask him for wisdom because he said that. He said, anybody lacks wisdom? Ask God and he will give it to you without finding fault. So if you don't know, then just say, God, I need some wisdom and patience here because I don't understand this. But if you hear something and it lines up with his word, that's probably from him. So why would we be hearing something and it not be from God? Well, that's where our enemies come in. That's where our own earthly nature likes to trip us up. And that's where the devil likes to get in there. He did it in the very beginning. With, with the woman, with Eve, he said, did God really say that? A simple question brought her right into it. Jesus said that the devil was a liar from the beginning and a murderer from the beginning, that there's no truth in him, that what he speaks is just lies. This is why contending for the faith, fighting for our faith in Jesus, in the truth of God's word is so important because we know there's a lot of untruths and non-truths in this world. If we're not spending time with God, which Jesus gave us an awesome example because quite frequently he would go off by himself and just spend time with the Father. And then he would also spend time with the disciples and other people so if we're not spending time with God and his word and praying and we're not spending time together, we're setting ourselves up. We're putting ourselves out there into a dangerous place because the enemy doesn't fight with gloves. The gloves coming off with him. He fights dirty. But we have somebody that fights for us who is greater than the enemy. God fights for us. God is our champion, and he has made us, the word says, more than conquerors. He has given us the authority, the power, and the courage to fight against our own sin. Remember, we're not talking about fighting against other people or each other. That's what the enemy wants. We're talking about fighting against our own sin, our own selfishness, our own pride, all of these things that try to trip us up. There's a lot of scriptures in the Bible that People say, oh, it's my favorite Bible verse, and they're usually pretty like, you know, for God so loved the world, or, you know, these, these really uplifting. I have a favorite, one of my favorites, um, and you'd hear it go, really? It's one of my favorites because it reminds me of who I'm fighting against. Paul wrote in 8, 7, Romans 8, 7, for the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. Now, if we read that verse without the knowledge of who God is, without understanding his word, that seems pretty like, well, that stinks. I kind of feel like there's no hope. But that's the awesome thing, because there is hope. There is hope beyond what we can even comprehend fully. That hope is Jesus. Jesus has made a way that we can actually overcome that sinful nature. That before him, when we were in it, we were lost. But when we come to him and say, Lord Jesus, I'm asking you, please save me from this sinful nature. Then the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within us. Not just next to us, not just in front or behind like we saw God doing in the Old Testament, but in us. You can't get closer than that. And he's saying, this sinful nature, don't worry, we can fight this together. I'm going to give you everything you need. All you have to do is trust me is spend time with me because if you don't, you're not going to recognize when I am talking to you. If we don't know his word, then we will hear those voices go, I think that's from God, I'm not sure. And it may not be. Fighting for the faith simply looks like spending time with your heavenly father, with your creator, with the one who loves you more than you can fathom. That verse reminds me that when I want to start taking a verse like that, what Jude wrote and saying ungodly people, and I say, oh yeah, who is that? Hmm, I'm going to start watching out for people. It reminds me, look in the mirror. It reminds me that it has to start here. 
And if I really want to encourage people, I need to stop doing this and I need to start going, I'm just trying to live by this. If I want to be a real encouragement to people, then I need to start living my life for the Lord. What did Jesus say in Matthew 5? Let your light shine before all men so they may what? See your good works. And then what's the result of that? That they would glorify your Father in heaven. Live for the Lord and he's going to open all kinds of doors that we get to share the gospel. Because people will see you and go, man, they, they really care about people. They really seem to exude like what real love should look like. They talk in a way that's just a little bit different. And I don't know what that means, but it's something I want to learn more about. I don't know how many times through my life when I thought I was just kind of doing my, my own thing, minding my own business, and, and I was just you know, trying to live for God, and somebody would come up and a conversation would start. And be like, why, are you, why do you not do some of the things that other people do? Like, why don't you, you know, get in some of these conversations or talk bad about people or put people down or stuff like that? Not that I've never done that. I'm guilty of doing so many things throughout life that God is so merciful. But when I, when I was living for the Lord and, and seeing those things, people were watching and it wasn't like I had to stand on a box in the middle of you know, Times Square and like hold up a sign to get somebody's attention. I just had to live for the Lord wherever I was, at work, in my community. It, we make it really complicated. Jude is just saying, look, there's some things you can watch out for. He brings up some examples like Cain and Balaam and Korah. Some issues there with hatred and greed. And Korah, the sons of Korah, they were given responsibilities, but they wanted what Moses had. They were just ungrateful. Do you know that there's a part of the brain that expresses where we, they, they've measured when we're grateful, they measure and they've shown it's there, but that same part of the brain is where when we're anxious and we're feeling that high anxiety it's that same part and yet you can't the brain can't function those two things at the same time you're either grateful or you're in a mode of anxiety so if you're ever feeling anxious you know what the bible says to do think on those things that are worth thinking about things that are pure things that are holy things that are just Start thanking God for what he's done. God has given us so many opportunities to know, again, who we are and who we're not. Jude points these men out, and then he says that they have gone astray. And that these same people that he's writing about here, they've gone astray. They've denied Jesus who died for them. He died for them. This is why we can't go pointing fingers thinking that we're better than somebody else because Jesus died for them too. There's a difference. There's a big difference between calling out sin and what the Bible calls condemnation. We are to be discerning, discerning what is sin and, and what's going on around us. Yeah, absolutely. But we have no authority to condemn. That's reserved for God and God only. So our goal is to let people know like he is the judge and he has made a way for you to escape that judgment and it's through Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life and no one comes to the Father except through him. That, that's his words. And I know sometimes we hear things like that and go, oh, that's so narrow-minded. Yeah, it is, but not how we define narrow-mindedness. Again, this is our sinful nature talking. Well, narrow-mindedness means you're just, you don't. He's saying there's truth and there's lie. Focus on the truth and you're going to understand and see what the lie is. You're going to be able to identify it in your own life. So I think we have to, there's four things I think we have to kind of guard, to kind of watch out for that Jude is touching on here. Grumbling and complaining, 
no self-control, prideful attitude, and being deceptive. Now, those aren't the only four things that I think our sinful nature wants to, like, you know, kind of rile up or that the enemy tempts us with. But those are four things that he's talking about here that we can clearly see in ourselves, that I can see in myself that, ooh, maybe I'm kind of getting off track here a little bit. Maybe I'm focusing on the wrong things. Maybe in my conflicts, I'm not keeping the main thing the main thing. Several months ago, I was telling my wife that I felt like I was just being like really grumpy. I felt like a grumpy old man. <laughs> like, get off my lawn. <laughs> I told her, I was like, man, I just feel like I'm, I'm kind of like being negative about a lot of stuff and I'm complaining and, and, and you know, I just, so grateful for her because she had, I love how Byron, Pastor Byron says about Gail, his wife, will say sometimes, you need to go spend some time with Jesus. <laughs> you just need a little bit of that. And, but I felt that, and, and it, because I was reading his word, and, and there were scriptures popping out like this in Jude and others, where it was like, man, am I really counting it all joy when I go through trials? Am I thanking God for what he's done for me? Am I recognizing and realizing that he has called me Giving me a, a home, a place of belonging in his family, and then giving me a mission to tell others about him. Instead, I was so focused on anything, anything that would go wrong. That was a red flag. That was the mercy of God saying, pay attention. I love you, and I want you to notice that this, or times when I've felt like I've had no self-control. I went through different areas of my life, different times of my life, different seasons where I've had no self-control. Sometimes it was with substances. Sometimes it was in relationships. A lot of times it's been with junk food. <laughs> Man, they make that taste so good. And it, 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 it reminds me, though, when I think about anything that I'm putting in my body or doing that is not good for it, and again, everything in moderation. I'm not, I mean, I'm going to go have some ice cream later today so I'm not saying that but what I'm saying is if that's all you're putting in then we're not taking care of the body God gave us right and so it's just it's just about re being reminded that God has given us so much to enjoy and so much for our good that when we do these things that are opposed to that it's really hurting us and we may not even see it so when we're being honest with God, going back to that, being open and honest with him, and we're in his word, we can see that. Oh, yeah, no self-control. Or being prideful. Right? The holier-than-thou attitude that, that I think from time to time we all struggle with, thinking like, I'm saved, I'm good, you know, forgetting, oh, my goodness, I need Jesus just as much today as I did when I first met him. I'm, I'm getting better. That's what the Bible says is happening as we walk with him, that we're being changed from one state of being to the next, becoming more and more like Jesus. That's what God's doing. That's what his grace is doing in our lives, changing us. But that tells us that we still need him every day. You and I need the Lord Jesus in our lives every day, whether we're just meeting him for the first time and it's your first step or maybe it's your 5,736th step and you need to take that next one. Keep growing. Keep fighting for this faith. Keep fighting for one another. So I want to leave you with this thought as we get ready to close today. Jude in verse 20 he touches on something really important, something that I think we take for granted for, from time to time and we maybe, or maybe we don't realize the gravity of it, the importance of it. He says, but you, dear friends, must say those four words with me right now on the count of three. One, two, three. Build each other up. Build each other up in your most holy faith. Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit and await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ who will bring you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourselves safe in God's love.
If we want to know how to build each other up, if we want to know how to encourage one another, if we want to know how we fight and contend for this faith, um, can you put these four words up there? Uh, listening, serving, encouraging, speaking truth. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. I think a lot of times in a conversation or in a relationship, we've got a lot of things we want to share, but if we really want to encourage somebody, if we really want to, to share the gospel with somebody, in any relationship, the best first thing we can do is just listen. You know, when Jesus was on this earth and there were so many people coming up to him, wanting all kinds of things, and he just, he just listened. Sometimes he would ask him, what, what would you have me do for you? And then he would, he would heal them or he would feed them but he started with just listening. You want to know how to encourage somebody, but you're not really sure what to say? Serve them. Serve each other. And encouraging can fit in those, but also what we talked about just a little bit ago. A little bit where you don't know what to say. You're not really sure what to do. Maybe you don't have an opportunity to, to really be in a, a, a conversation or a relationship with this person. You just want to encourage somebody around you. Again, whether they're, they're already in the body of Christ and you just want to encourage your brother or your sister or it's somebody that you want to share the gospel with but you don't know, you want to encourage, it goes back to that. Just, just spend time with the Lord and live for Him. And they'll see it. Speaking truth. I think this is one where we get tripped up a lot. Because this is one where oftentimes, and I've been guilty of it too, where we, we bring the Bible and we say, it, it says this, you should do this. Or are you doing that? Have you been faithful in that? Or maybe that area, okay, what about this area? You know, King David was writing one time with his men as soldiers. And this guy was chucking stones at him because he just didn't like what he was doing, basically. And, and one of his soldiers, remember, these are, these are some bad dudes. One of David's men was like, let me cut his head off. He shouldn't speak to the king that way. And David goes, you know, he might be wrong about this situation, but I've been guilty of other things. The purpose, the, the point of what he's saying is true. We all need Jesus every step of the way. And because we need Jesus every step of the way, as we walk with him, we're going to be able to have everything we need to fight for one another, to fight for this faith, to fight for those who don't know Jesus yet. Notice I didn't say fight against. Fight for we have our group season. We've talked about it. We've, we're going to be talking about it for a few weeks. Please, if you're not in a group, haven't been in a group, I would encourage you. If you want to fight for the faith that God has given you, you want to fight for those around you, I would encourage you. Check out a group. And we've got Fight Club and, and Treasured. We've got From This Day Forward Marriage Group coming up. We've got Financial Peace. Have you been struggling with some stuff lately? You're trying to get out of debt. You're, you're trying to figure out how to live life. That might be a great class. It goes like 12 weeks. We have a health group coming up that I'm so excited that a, a couple here are going to lead and just work through some stuff. There's so many opportunities God has given us. And like a brother said before, he's opening doors. Are we going to walk through them? The gloves are off. We got people who need to know about Jesus. We've got family who are going through stuff. 
We need to fight for each other. We need to fight for this faith God has given us. And he's given us all the tools we need. We just need to spend time with him and allow him to train us up and walk through that door and say, I'm going to do this.